I once heard somebody say that there's no such thing as the search for answers. There is only the search for better questions. And the guy that I heard say this was someone named uh, John Polkinghorne. Polkinghorne was someone who really knew how to ask good questions. He began his career actually as a scientist. And he spent many years working in the area of particle physics and theoretical physics. He even played a role in the discovery of the subatomic particle that we now call the quark. But at the age of 51, Polkinghorne resigned from his position at Cambridge University and became a priest. He became an Anglican priest, actually. He went from asking one kind of question to a different kind of question. And not long after his ordination, he began writing about the relationship between faith and science. And by the time he died, just two years ago, in fact, he'd written more than 20 books on the subject both as a physicist and as a priest and a theologian, Polkinghorne distinguished himself by his capacity to ask really good questions. And Polkinghorne suggested that in order for a question to be a good question, it has to do two things. First, it has to yield an answer. A question that doesn't seek an answer isn't really a question, it's either a mistake or it's an assertion posing as a question. But a really good question will do more than just yield an answer. The second thing a good question will do is it will yield another question. Really good questions don't take us to stopping points. They take us to new starting points. A really good line of questioning will lead us into a deeper understanding of whatever it is we're talking about. And Polkinghorne discovered that was true both as a scientist and as a priest and as a theologian. Now, in today's gospel lesson, Jesus puts before his disciples and he puts before us a really good question. Actually, he asks two questions. <clears throat> First question is not bad. It doesn't really go anywhere. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? That question results in a variety of responses. Well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah. We hear pretty much the same thing today. Ask a bunch of people who Jesus is, you'll get a range of answers. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi, Jesus was a great spiritual teacher, Jesus was a mystic, Jesus was a revolutionary, Jesus was a deluded crackpot. All those answers are available in the marketplace of ideas. None of those answers really go anywhere. It's obvious that most people, both then and now, thought that Jesus was someone special, but it's also just as obvious that nobody really knows what to make of him. So they look for familiar patterns. None of the patterns quite fit. Maybe he's a rabbi, maybe he's a prophet. Mm. Asking his disciples what other people thought about him didn't really take the disciples of Jesus anywhere. But then Jesus asks a really good question. Who do you say that I am? That is a question that not only invites an answer, it is a question that forces other questions, not only about Jesus, but about ourselves. Asking his disciples what they thought about him rather than what other people thought about him takes the disciples of Jesus to an entirely new place. Their answers would not only reveal something about what they thought about Jesus, it would reveal something important about how they thought about themselves and their relationship with him. Now, in order for us to really appreciate the challenge that this question presents, the challenge that Jesus puts before his disciples and puts before us, we need to account for the context within which this story appears. It is no accident that the gospel writer portrays this event as having happened when it did, and where it did. Now, you'll remember last week we heard that Jesus was in the district of Tyre and Sidon, Gentile territory, northwest of Galilee, outside of Israel. Now he's gone east, but he's still in Gentile territory, still north of Israel proper. Matthew indicates that Jesus and his disciples had come into the district of Caesarea Philippi. And this was a region that was ruled by Philip the Tetrarch, one of the sons of Herod the Great. This was also a center of pagan religious observance. There were ancient temples scattered about dedicated to the gods of the Syrians. There were not one, not two, but three 
more recent temples dedicated to Caesar Augustus. And there was something else there. The Jewish historian Josephus writes that at the base of Mount Hermon, near Caesarea Philippi, there was a cave that went deep into the heart of the earth. And out of that cave flowed the headwaters of the Jordan River. But there was said to be more than water in the cave at the base of Mount Hermon. The Greeks said that was the birthplace of the god Pan. The locals said that that cave was the doorway to the realm of the dead, the very gates to the kingdom of Hades, the god of the underworld. In other words, Caesarea Philippi is not a good place for Jews to be. Temples dedicated to Syrian gods, monuments dedicated to a purportedly divine Roman emperor, mysterious caves associated with the land of the dead. This was not the kind of place where pious Jews went to hang out. This was, as far as Jews were concerned, a bad place. And it's here that Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? Jesus is forcing his disciples to think about this question in a place where they would have been very cognizant of the competing claims of several different powers and several different authorities. He has set himself over and against the expectations of his own people. He wants his disciples to see what the crowds did not see. He is more than a prophet. He's not John the Baptist. He's not Elijah. He's not Jeremiah. He's something else. And he also sets himself over and against the competing claims of other religious traditions. The question he's forcing them to ask is, who is God? Is God one of the lords of the Syrians? Is God one of the Baals? Is God one of the Greco-Roman deities like Pan or Hades? Or is God the one Jesus called his father, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob? And he also, at the same time, sets himself over and against the cultural and political power of the Roman Empire. How does Jesus compare to the temples dedicated to one of the most powerful rulers on earth, Caesar Augustus himself? How does Jesus stack up next to the power of the state, next to the power of the Roman army and the Roman government and the whole apparatus of imperial Roman control? How does Jesus look next to that? All of that is implied in this seemingly simple question. Who do you say that I am? And to that question, Simon Peter faithfully responds, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. Peter tells us something important about God. He tells us something important about Jesus. And he tells us something important about himself. He tells us that he recognizes Jesus as someone who is more than a prophet, someone who served a God greater than all other gods, someone who is not subject to the apparatus of imperial political state control. Peter's answer is a good answer because it drives us towards more questions. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Great. Now what does that mean relative to all this other stuff that's going on around us? What does that mean in light of the expectations of those in Israel who were waiting for a Messiah? What does that mean in light of the competing claims of other religious traditions? What does it mean for Peter himself and for the other disciples? Jesus asked them a question and they gave him an answer and they spent the rest of their lives figuring out that answer. <laughs> they discovered that their answer was not a stopping point, that answer was a new starting point. And Jesus, of course, puts the same question before us. And we may not feel ourselves to be in a territory like Caesarea Philippi, temples, legends, state power, but make no mistake, we live in a world in which it appears there are any number of gods. There are lots of voices clamoring to be heard all the time. Lots of voices all claiming to be the Messiah, all claiming to have the answer to life. And in the midst of those voices, Jesus confronts us with a question. Relative to all this other stuff, who do you say that I am? Have we answered that question in a way that provides us with a stopping point? Or have we answered that question in a way that provides us 
with a new starting point? Have we got Jesus figured out? Or do we know that there is more to him than meets our eye? If we want to say with Peter that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, do we have some sense of what that means for the rest of our lives? What does that mean, for example, for our families? What does it mean for the way we approach work? What does it mean for our experience of school? What does it mean for our relationships, our friendships? What does it mean for the way that we spend our time, the way that we spend our money? What does it mean for the way that we participate in the public life of our nation? If we give any other answer to the question that Jesus poses, other than the answer that Peter gave, then we will find ourselves not having to ask those questions. If we say Jesus was a nice man who tried to teach the world some simple ideas about loving one's neighbor, we're done. We have reached a stopping point, no new starting point, no more questions necessary. We have figured Jesus out. If we say that Jesus was a self-deluded Jewish prophet who had some strange ideas about the end of the world, we're done. Stopping point, no more questions. But when we answer with Peter that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, Immediately, a host of questions pop up. Jesus is no longer just an interesting figure from the past. Jesus is now a living presence, active in our lives and active in the world today. If Jesus is the Messiah, then he is no longer someone we can think about whenever we happen to need a spiritual fix. If he is the son of the living God, we need to be thinking about Jesus all the time. (laughs) When we say that he is the son of the living God, we're implicitly saying that he has a rightful claim on every part of our lives. And when we say that about him, we say something very important about ourselves. We say that we live and move and have our very being in him, that he is the one in whom and through whom and for whom we have been made. The meaning of our lives become grounded in his life. So you may not feel yourself to be in a place that feels very much like Caesarea Philippi. We don't have a lot of polytheistic pagan temples scattered around North Texas. As far as I know, nobody's ever made the claim that the Katy Trail leads to the underworld. Maybe, I don't know. (laughs) But our culture has other gods. Our culture has other imperial authorities. There are other voices always clamoring to be heard, always competing for our allegiance. There are any number of options out there all presenting themselves as answers to the question of the meaning and the purpose of our lives. The interesting thing about those other voices is that they usually insist. They demand. They impose. They answer for us. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus asks and then waits for us to respond. Most of the voices around us offer answers that lead nowhere. They don't lead to better questions. They don't lead to a deeper or better awareness of what life is about. They provide us with answers that are designed to stop us and to hold us in place rather than to invite us further up and further in into a reality that transcends all our knowing. In the midst of all of those voices, all the voices around us, there is one voice that still asks, who do you say that I am? How we answer that question will ultimately shape the direction of our lives. How we answer that question will ultimately determine everything else.